Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're out at the range with a new handgun from Century Arms. They're importing it from Turkey, and it is another pistol in the Janik series of pistols. In that line of pistols, we've seen the original TP9, the V2, the TP, SA, SF, Elite, SFX, now the DA. There's been a whole bunch of pistols in the Janik series of handguns imported by Century Arms over the years. It almost seems as though they introduce one or two models a year, but I don't know if that's really true. But there are an awful lot of models that have been coming out of Janik. And this is one of the most recent versions. What's different about this handgun? Well, what's old is new again. It seems that uh, the TP9 series of pistols have gone through an evolution. Originally, they were pretty much a direct copy of the Walther P99. There were some differences, obviously, there are magazine differences and some other dimensional differences, but for the most part, it, it seemed to me as though it was pretty much a clone of the Walther pistol. Then it started to evolve. One of the gripes about the original pistol was that the trigger was atrocious, and I agreed that it was pretty bad. And it was a double action, single action striker fired handgun. So it meant that you could actually carry it, decock it, carry it with the striker fully forward, so you had something similar to a double action trigger pull when you fired that gun for the first shot. After that, the second shot was more of a single action trigger pull because the striker was cocked. They went through a number of different evolutionary changes, again, to address the problems that, uh, or I wouldn't even necessarily call them problems, some of the features or uh, some of the dislikes of the handgun that people had from the very first model, which is what got us to the DA that we have here today, which is pretty much um, just a refined version of the original TP9 with its double action, single action trigger, but with some differences yet again. It does have a vastly improved trigger. I will give credit where credit's due, and this gun does have a very nice trigger in it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is the double action version of the pistol. Uh, I wanted to get one of these because I do plan on running it through the gauntlet. The handgun with its double strike capabilities may allow it to get further through the gauntlet than other pistols have in the past. If you take a look at uh, the, the Rex-01 video that kind of started the whole gauntlet series, you'll notice that uh, one or two times in that video I had to pull a trigger for a second time to get the gun to fire because so much crud had accumulated in the gun that the, the slide wasn't going all the way home. Even in my CZP07 video where I forgot, and I beat myself up for this, forgot to pull the trigger a second time when that slide hadn't gone all the way into battery and I got a click instead of a bang, I, I immediately ran the slide, put a fresh round in, but I had the option of pulling a trigger the second time and perhaps the gun would have went off. I may have to revisit that later this summer. So the double strike capability seems to actually have some value. Now, I've never been a, an advocate for drug, double strike capability. I always thought that if a round fails you on the first shot, there's a good chance it's gonna fail you on the second shot, especially if the gun hasn't been subjected to any type of debris, mud, sand, dirt, water, whatever. Uh, I would just run the slide, get that bad round out, and resume shooting. But there are advocates of double, double strike capability, and it would seem in adverse conditions that perhaps there is some use to that capability, which brings me back to the DA pistol that I have here. So I'm going to talk about some of the differences between this, the original TP9, talk about the TP9 in general. I'll even touch upon the politics of Turkey at the moment and try to address everything that I can about the, um, the Janik pistols, the current evolution of those pistols, and again, the politics behind it which is kind of interesting in and of itself. All right, guys, I'm gonna load up some magazines. Uh, we do have to do a break in on the handgun because we wanna subject it to the gauntlet. Now, no, I don't think that handguns should be broken in. They should be reliable right out of the box, but many of you guys suggested one of the protocol changes I should make is to introduce um, a break in period for new guns to give them a chance to compete competitively in the gauntlet. So that's what I'm doing today is I'm trying to get that 500 round count so I can include the TP9, uh, DA or double action pistol in the gauntlet tests this summer. So again, let's go load up some magazines and do some shooting. Today we're going to do our break in with Freedom Munitions 124 grain ball. This is their newly manufactured stuff. This is not their remanufactured line. And uh, I've had pretty good luck with Freedom Munitions and I want to thank them for uh, supporting us here at the Military Arms Channel with donations of ammunition. So let's talk about the DA pistol really quickly before we shoot the first few rounds out of it here uh, this afternoon. So the DA pistol is the latest in the evolutionary changes of the handgun. Now, one of the biggest things that I had against the TP9 was the SA. Now, this is the DA, which is the double action version. The SA, I'm gonna go ahead and guess, is, is uh, it stands for single action. And this is that pistol. You've seen it here before on the channel. You'll notice this pistol has a decocker on the top of the slide just as the new DA pistol does, the one that I'm wiggling. 
They both have decockers, but there's a major difference between the two pistols. So in their quest to produce a handgun with a better trigger than the original TP9, they went and decided to uh, include the decocker, but not include the double action functionality. Apparently the double action functionality was a contributor to the rather poor trigger of the original handgun. So this handgun, you can decock, and it has a very light trigger pull. Now the problem with this decock, which I called the kill switch, is that it totally deactivates the handgun. You have a dead trigger now. So if you inadvertently do that just by, you know, motion and you're not thinking, you hit the decock button, whatever, uh, you kind of leave yourself in a bad position if you're using this gun for concealed carry. Now there's very little chance that you could accidentally hit that button. What I'm concerned with and what concerned me about the pistol in the beginning was that uh, if, if I'm just loading the gun, I'm not paying attention, which happens a lot, unfortunately. People don't pay uh, attention. They're so used to hitting the decock. Um, they hit the decock not thinking, put the gun in the holster. Then when they come to the moment of truth, when they actually need their weapon, they pull their weapon and they have a dead trigger. So I don't like kill switches on guns. I don't like buttons that turn them off. And some people had suggested that you could slightly do a press check to recock the striker, which that does work. However, I don't think I would try to be doing press checks in a gunfight. If somebody's shooting at me, chances are adrenaline's flowing and my ability to do just a quick press check to recock the pistol probably isn't gonna be there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and burn that round and cock the pistol and start shooting. Just because, you know, that's probably the most efficient way to ready the weapon. So I know some of you guys in the past have said, oh, all I gotta do is just do a quick press check and it'll recock the pistol. I guess if you practice that, I, it's just not something I would do. I'll just run the slide. But you'll also notice that this handgun, the SA has ambi decocking capabilities so I can decock it with either the right or left hand. That functionality has been taken away with the new DA pistol. This is strictly a right-handed shooter's handgun. There are no facilities on the left hand, I'm sorry, the right hand side of the pistol for left hand use to either drop the slide, lock the slide open, or decock the pistol. Uh, you, you don't even have a magazine release. Now that may be reversible, I don't know, but this gun is definitely set up to be a right-handed shooter's handgun, which is gonna cause roughly 13% of the population to not wanna buy the gun. So this was something of a flop when compared to other products in the TP9 series of handguns, or so I believe, which is why they pretty much uh, came out with that uh, following year. Did it take a whole year? It took them a little while. I ran into the SF pistol while I was on my first trip to Turkey, and I ran into it in a local gun store and posted a picture on Instagram before it actually hit the US market, so I knew it was coming. The SF deleted the kill switch altogether. No decocker. It just had a really good single action trigger pull. There's no way to turn the gun off anymore, and that corrected the problems I, I had with this handgun. So fast forward, they've gone through a couple of different model releases before getting to the DA. They've had the Elite series, the, T, uh, the SA, or SFX series of pistols. I, I have a hard time keep, keep, keeping up with all the different models of this handgun they've come out with. So this is one, again, that interests me because that double action uh, striker system, I actually have come to like. I, I like the ability of that second strike capability where if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said, I, uh, I don't like it or I find no use for it. There's no reason to really dislike it. It's kind of passive. So the magazines on the TP9s are all interchangeable. So if you have an older TP9, you should be able to get away with using the magazines. At least that's been in my experience with the TP9s I own. I don't have an original model. I just have uh, the later models, but all the magazines with my later models, the SF, the SA, uh, the Elite, the DA, and all those use the same 18 round magazine. So that's kind of nice. It, it looks like a relatively small pistol, but it's a full-size duty pistol, but it does hold 18 rounds in the magazine. I only have 15 loaded because that's just my OCD kicking in. I, uh, I don't like having odd numbers of rounds. Well, five is an odd number, but I don't like having three rounds in a row. I always load my magazines in rows of five. It's just convenient because handgun, loads, uh, handgun rounds almost always come in boxes of 50. So I've only loaded 15 rounds. Didn't have the magazine fully seated. So I've chambered that first round. Now let's let's fire this gun and see how it works right out of the box. This is literally the very first time this handgun has been fired. I'm gonna go ahead and use it in single action mode.
and she locks open. So as with most of these handguns, it shoots just the same. It feels really good. It's an ergonomic pistol. It seems to fit in my hand very well. And uh, the gun just shoots nice. The recoil spring is kind of heavy for a nine millimeter, but I think that probably contributes to the perception of very low recoil. The sights stay on target. So really nothing surprising there. It handles very much like the other TP9s that I've shot and own. Let's put another 15 rounds into the pistol. And this time I'm gonna decock it and check out that double action trigger pull. That's pretty interesting, it's nice. It's, it's a little plasticky feeling, a little bit spongy feeling, but it's pretty consistent in its pull. It doesn't get hard at the end or it isn't super heavy. But it is very stagey. That, that, that plasticky creep to it makes the trigger kind of, you know, pull easy, a little harder, a little easier, a little harder. So it's a very stagey feeling. I imagine that might work itself in with a little bit of use. But I'm able to hit the targets at 20 yards really easily. Yeah, I definitely like the single action better. Huh, yeah, it shoots really nice. No malfunctions, first two magazines, only 30 rounds in, but I've come to expect that type of reliability out of the handguns. Now I just wanted to see how it worked out of the box. This is exactly how it shipped to me, including the packing grease that's on it. I'm gonna go over and do what I normally do now. I'm gonna wipe the gun down with some CLP, get the grease off the inside rails. They use, I don't know if you can still see it or not. I'll go ahead and take the pistol apart. You may be able to see it right here. It's a very light gray paste that they ship the gun with and you'll see it inside the slide right there as well. I don't know if the lighting is going to be such that you guys can actually see this. But um, so I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the gun, lube it up properly. The gun seems to work just fine out of the box. It's just one of the things I like to see how the guns work. And now let's lube her up and shoot her some more. I'm gonna give you guys a real quick breakdown on how to take the gun apart. I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times before if you've ever watched a TP9 video. I'm gonna go ahead and drop the magazine out. This one's already had the magazine removed. Lock the slide to the rear, check the chamber, make sure the weapon's empty. And now I'm gonna pull the striker in a safe direction, decock it, pull down on these little tabs on either side of the pistol, pull down on those and push the slide off the frame rails. Now you can see that grease in there a little bit better. You can see it on the slide rails and the grease inside the slide. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and clean her up with some CLP. Notice I did not put any CLP into the striker channel itself. Yes, that can cause the gun's problem, especially when we're doing the gauntlet tests. Just get a little bit of lubricant on the gun. Get some of that grease off of it. I've been using CLP for 30 some years, guys, almost 30 years, I guess. And uh, I still like it. I have been testing the break through clean stuff and I like it as well, uh, especially like the grease. I use it on my carry gun. I'll talk more about that in the future. So you'll notice that much like a Glock, this has the slide rails embedded into the polymer. Very simple little gun to maintain. And 
Just wipe the barrel down here really quick. All right. That easy to clean it up and get it ready. So the, the guide rod is steel on here, so it doesn't flex, which is nice. I've seen polymer guide rods break on other pistols. So put it back together very simple. And there you go. She's all ready to shoot some more. All right, guys, I want to address the whole issue of doing business with Turkey because I know that the comments down below are going to blow up with people saying, screw Turkey or Turkey sucks or whatever. So I've seen Turkey um, on both sides of Erdogan. I went to Turkey for the first time before Erdogan became the dictator that he currently is, and I've been to Turkey after he came to power. And I did see a shift politically within the government, and it was pretty drastic, so much so that uh, you went from a secular society that was very open, uh, you know, you had... Uh, women running around in fishnet stockings and, and smoking and drinking and guys doing whatever they wanted. They even had, you know, areas of, of Istanbul where there's a gay community and all sorts of stuff that was very secular. Uh, and, and he is not. Erdogan is a radical in every sense of the word, and now he's become a dictator. So I've seen both sides of Turkey. I know the Turkish people to be very, very good people. They treated me very well. I went to the Ankara Mall during Christmas or right before Christmas on, on one of my trips over and saw a big Christmas tree outside. And then when I went into the mall, they had a bunch of Santa Clauses, people dressed up like Santa Claus on every level of the mall. And that's a very secular thinking given that, you know, that's kind of a Christian thing. So anyway, I know that Turkey, the people of Turkey are good people. So now, will I buy Turkish goods because I don't agree with Erdogan or I don't agree with the Armenian genocide, which took place at the turn of the century, a century ago in the 1900s? I don't want to punish the, the current Turkish people before, because of the actions of their government or past actions of their government any more than I think people should judge Americans for our past actions or our current administrations. There are people out there that absolutely hate Trump right now that would not support American workers by buying our goods because they dislike Trump. Or during the Obama administration, they may not like to support the American workers because they disliked Obama and what he was doing globally. So politicians come and go, governments change all the time. And I try not to get too wrapped up in global politics when making a firearms purchase, okay? There are a lot of good Americans over here in the United States that are working, getting paid to import these firearms from all over the world. I have guns made in Nazi Germany. I have guns made in Imperial Japan. I have, you know, all sorts of World War II uh, um, Italian firearms under a fascist government. I, I don't let the politics dictate what purchases I make because... I just can't. I, and that's why I've said in the past, I don't let global politics get involved too much in my, my uh, purchases. But I understand that some of you guys will. Now, one thing I always thought was pretty interesting about the Armenian genocide is that the people that gave me flack for that were Americans, many of them. And they totally disregarded the fact that Americans committed genocide against the Native Americans during our westward expansion phase. So all countries have something that they've done in the past that is horrible. And I just don't make current purchasing decisions based upon global politics. Otherwise, I'd never be able to buy a gun. I'd never be able to buy an H&K because of what they did during the Holocaust. I'd never be able to buy anything because I can find something that every nation has done at some point in its past that I could say, ah, I'm not going to support them because they're jerks and this is why. So that's my position, guys. That's why I say don't get involved in, in global politics when making a purchasing decision. I know some of you will disagree with that and you have every right to in a free society to do that. So I know that you're going to give me some flack. Some of you guys will give me some flack for purchasing Turkish firearms, but this is my response to you. And if you can't accept that, well, that's your problem because in a free society, we should be able to make decisions freely. And uh, I'm not going to condemn you for your decisions. I'm not going to call you names. I'd appreciate it if you don't do that with regards to me when I'm expressing my views and, and how I see the world and why I make the purchases that I make.
for your roughly 350 bucks, this is what you're gonna get in the box with your Janik pistol. We have the gun in a holster. We have two magazines, both 18 round metal magazines, magazine loader, a trigger lock, and your owner's manual cleaning brush up here. Now let's talk about that holster for a second. The holster is a little bit unique by today's standards. It has this strap that goes around the back of the pistol. And it's a snap that holds it in place. The gun has some level of retention. I'm kind of reluctant to hold it like this, but uh, it has this button on the side that resembles a Serpa retention holster that you would need to press or depress to get the gun out of the holster. But that's not the case. I'm just gonna hold the holster without hitting the button and I can easily pull the gun out. It does clip around the trigger guard and give you some level of retention, but it's not a true retention holster as you don't have to press that button. The back strap, again, a bit odd by today's standards, but if you're on a budget, you can buy the gun for 350 bucks and get a functional holster with it. The holster is definitely designed for right-handed users, and you can see right here where you put the paddle on the holster, the screw that holds it in place. You have to assemble it yourself, but you can adjust the rake of the holster. So you can have it straight up and down. You can put it a, a, a rake forward or rake back, depending on how you want to carry the gun. So that's what the gun comes with these days. Like I said, it seems to change ever so often uh, what you get with the gun. The fact that they're thrown in a holster now is uh, pretty interesting. And sometimes you'll see things that kind of give you an indication of what's to come. The foam cutout right here, hasn't been pulled out, but that certainly looks like a threaded barrel. I'm wondering if Century plans on introducing this handgun, the DA, with a, uh, a threaded barrel. That'd be kind of cool, because I like to suppress everything. All right, guys, it's time to wind things up for this afternoon. I've gotten about 300 rounds to the gun, and I'll, I'll bring it out for one or two more range sessions before I run through the gauntlet. I just wanted to get a feel for it, break it in a little bit, clean it up, bring you guys along to the range. I had no malfunctions with the 124 grain ball from Freedom Munitions, and the gun seems to be running just fine, as all of my Janik pistols have. Now, I have kept my finger on the pulse of what's going on out there online, and I have seen some guys say that they've had some problems with the... Uh, Oh, what is it, the Elite Series version of these with the red trigger? And I think it was a spring issue based upon what I had read in some of the threads on some of the forums, and Century was taking care of it. I've never had an issue with any of my TP9s. I don't know if I just got lucky in the case of the TP9s, but they've been darn good handguns, in my opinion, in terms of reliability, shootability, ergonomics, everything you would measure a handgun by. They've been a good value, in my opinion. So these things are still retailing for right around 350 bucks. If you shop around online, you'll, you'll find them as high as 412 all the way down to 350 So shop around to get the most out of your money if you're in the market for a Janik pistol. Guys, I'm going to ask you to do something I don't typically do or have it in the past, and that's to join the NRA. The NRA is under new leadership with Pete Brownell of Brownell's fame. And the NRA is going through a transformation. I wholeheartedly believe in that. And for the next four years, I'm setting my differences with the NRA aside, giving them a new chance with a new leadership. I've spoken personally with Pete. I've met with him in person many times, talked with him many times on the phone. And I'm 100% behind the NRA in their effort to roll back some of the draconian gun laws we currently live under, going from a defensive position to an offensive position, which I 100% support. And I believe in it so much, I actually became a life member, which is something I said I would never do. So I'm asking that you guys join me in our fight. We have four years and a very unique opportunity to set these differences aside, come together, and fight for our collective rights. If you follow the link down below, that link is a special link. I will receive money back from you renewing your membership or becoming a new member. Even right now, as of the day of this recording, they're running a special in lifetime members, which is down to $600. That's what I picked mine up for. So uh, please follow that link. All the proceeds that come back to me are donated 100% to Hero Hunt, which is a group that uh, is a nonprofit organization that helps first responders, wounded warriors, all sorts of people get back out, get into the field, get hunting, share some time with like-minded people and help them with some of the troubles that they're experiencing. Also, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, guys, please swing by and become a supporter over on Patreon. Patreon is a way for you to directly support the content that we produce here, but also as a thank you to you guys, we've turned it into something of a buyer's club. Instead of, instead of doing a box, which uh, the guys over at Iraq Veteran do the best out there in my opinion, but they've seen a lot of competition come up where you pay 30 bucks a month or more to, to get content in the boxes. Instead of doing something like that, we decided to do a buyer's club for our patron supporters. And that means we're giving you some blowout deals and literally hundreds of dollars off what you could literally find these items for elsewhere on the internet. And we're doing that as a thank you. We're finding these great deals and passing those savings along to you guys as, again, a thank you for supporting us. 
And if you guys would like to support us other ways, you can of course just swing by and check us out at Copper Custom, which is coppercustom.com, which is our online store. Also, check out Full30.com. It's the gun tube of sorts. We've taken all the internet's best firearms content creators and brought them under one roof, and that is Full30.com. Guys, I'm going to check out now, fire a couple of last magazines, head home after I pack up all this equipment, get ready to do some editing to bring this video to you guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all those years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon. Take it easy, guys.